Good evening. This is VK3 EKH, VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel, the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria, with the uh, regular Friday night broadcast coming to you from the studios of VK3 Charlie Sierra Juliet in Narry Warren South. This is VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel, first broadcast for the year 2022. We welcome all listeners, shortwave listeners, medium wave listeners, and YouTubers to the first transmission for 2022. Sorry, what was that? Um, hmm, okay, how's that? One, two, three, four, five. What's that? That usually fixes it up. Um, is it echo or is it just uh, what sort of um, not sure where that would be coming from um, just stand by the first technical issue for the uh, first broadcast what is it what kind of echo is it TV on the background um, all right, one, two, three, four, five. How's that? Okay. Uh, I'm not sure where that's coming from. Anyway, I'll just have to remember to turn that up when I go to uh, the program. All right, back live. <laughs> uh, welcome to TV. Um, <clears throat> we're also broadcasting by the Melbourne TV repeater, VK3RTV, digital channel number two. Uh, and unfortunately the transmission for a little while will be presented in standard definition the um, HD side of the, the station decided to go funny a few weeks ago and uh, I'm not 100% sure what happened to the HD transmitter uh, but we're uh, now using the standby transmitter the one that I've uh, usually used for the TV side of it so uh, standard definition although if you want HD um, you can go to my YouTube channel, uh, VK3CSJ. Just look, uh, type in VK3CSJ in your favourite search engine, and uh, you'll find the live uh, YouTube uh, uh, stream, which will be in uh, reasonable HD. So you can still get HD via the YouTube side of it. Um, anyway, there's no uh, audio stream. I still haven't sussed out the audio stream aspect to, to the station. You know, I've been off there for what three or four weeks I think it is and uh, I only really got back up here to get things sorted out today so well, it's nothing unusual for uh, for me anyway good evening to everybody I trust that uh, everybody's had a, a lovely Christmas for what it's worth and uh, also uh, all the best for the year 2022 which um, I don't see a whole lot of differences to last year going to occur but nevertheless let's hope uh, 22 turns out to be a little bit better um, anyways, uh, all right, so um, now the uh, first thing I, I will just to kick off with is, uh, oh, and also an email address. If uh, for any reports, you can send uh, emails to uh, vk3ekh at gmail.com, vk3ekh at gmail.com, and I'm looking at the inbox as I speak, and also uh, there's the chat window. Uh, via Discord, uh, which can be found at the ASV website at www.asv.org.au. Look under the Radio Astronomy tab and for the ASV broadcast, and uh, the link uh, to the YouTube channel will be there, as well as the Discord, uh, and you can uh, log in uh, anonymously or with your call sign or name, whatever you want. So uh, uh, I can see that uh, Richo is there. VK3 uh, VRS is uh, absolutely excited that there's a broadcast tonight for the first time in a few weeks. And uh, g'day Martin, VK7 uh, JAH is also with us. And uh, Dave, VK3 JL. Uh, g'day Dave, welcome to, uh, to the session tonight. Well, all right, um, let's see now. Uh, the Astronomical Society of Victoria, which I do this on behalf of, and a very pleasant good evening to uh, to uh, anybody that's up at the Dark Sky site um, up there. 
Uh, I know there's been a lot of activity uh, going on uh, up at uh, ASV, uh, sorry, up at the um, Leon Mao Dark Sky site. And uh, I can see that there's been some very interesting uh, roadworks going on uh, around the dish. So uh, uh, thanks to all the guys that have been involved in that uh, project over the last few days. That's uh, completely upset our seismometer, I'll have you know. Um, <laughs> the Astronomical Society of Victoria was founded in 1922 and uh, it comprises over 1600 members throughout Victoria, the other states of Australia and overseas. Membership of the Society is open to all persons with an interest in astronomy. The Society's objectives are to encourage the study and practice of astronomy, to disseminate the knowledge of the science and to provide greater facilities for the study among its members. Monthly meetings are usually held on the second Wednesday of each month except in January, the latter being held on a Saturday night. Meetings start at 8pm in the Mullior Hall, Burwood Avenue, Melbourne, near the Melbourne Observatory. Uh, which is located not too far from the Shrine of Remembrance. Parking is available in Burwood Avenue, Dallas Brooks Drive and within the surrounding streets. Admission is free and uh, visitors are most welcome. Privileges of membership include the right to borrow books, periodicals and other publications from the Society's extensive library located at the Melbourne Observatory. Receipt of the ASV's magazine crux containing articles, news, observing notes and the like and the free provision of the Astronomical Yearbook. <clears throat> Access is available to telescopes on members' nights held regularly at the Melbourne Observatory and after the monthly meetings, uh, weather permitting. The instruments uh, include the Society's 300mm equatorial reflector, a 300mm portable reflector. There's also a 200mm refractor managed by the Royal Botanic Gardens and a photo heliograph are also housed at the observatory and are accessible to members as well. Society, the Society also has a, a number of 200mm reflectors available for short period loan to members um, which they can try before they buy sort of uh, concept. Regular Society Club Night meetings are held on the first and last Fridays of each month at the Lodge which is the, the Society's property in Burwood. Members are encouraged to use the Society's instruments located there and gain to, to gain first-hand experience in telescope use. The instruments include a 508mm equatorial reflector and a number of smaller reflector telescopes. Members are also encouraged to make use of the Society's country property located near Heathcote, some 90 minute drive north of Melbourne. Uh, there are a range of instruments available for members to use and uh, the larger two only with appropriate training of course which range from 300 millimeter to 1000 millimeter aperture also located on the side is the 8.5 meter radio steerable telescope uh, which members can access with involvement in the radio astronomy section members are encouraged to make and use telescopes advice and help on both matters are provided willingly to newcomers desiring to do the same Instrument making is only one of the number of common interest acti activities catered for within the society. Other areas of interest that members can participate in include deep sky observing, astrophotography, lunar and planetary observing, auroral, meteor, comet and radio astronomy. There's uh, computing, cosmology and astrophysics, historical studies and research and astronomy of course in general. Contact details for various section directors are provided in the yearbook um, further information can be obtained by visiting the ASV website and notifications of events uh, given in the Crux Extra Bulletins sent out via email to members. Please note that the ASV will continue to to, um, to all government health directives and as far as the COVID situation is concerned, ASV events may be required to be cancelled, moved or postponed as a result of uh, those COVID restrictions that occur. Uh, if you want to write to the ASV, you can uh, write to the Secretary, the Astronomical Society of Victoria, GPO Box 1059, Melbourne, Victoria 3001. The Secretary, uh, Astronomical Society of Victoria, GPO Box 1059, Melbourne, Victoria 3001. 
So that's the general outline for the Astronomical Society of Victoria. The web page, a website for the ASV um, can be found. Get a bill. <coughs> can be found. Oh, I know it top of my head. <laughs> Um, at www.asv.org.au uh, that's www.asv.org.au and all will be revealed as Carl used to say many many years ago well uh, there it is um, now it is pretty much halfway through the month 21st of January so as far as the sky notes are concerned I can probably start halfway through the sky notes let's see what uh, Tanya Hill has written g'day Tanya if you're listening probably not um, <laughs> anyway uh, let's see um, okay oh, I won't worry about the moon phases uh, the planets a quick quick rundown of what's happening with the planets in the sky Mercury continues to be close to the Sun rising and setting during daytime and is not visible this month. Venus will not be visible for most of the month as it is passing in front of the Sun. It will however reappear towards the end of the month as the morning star. Good morning star shine. Love that song. Oliver. Um, visible uh, in the east from around 4.45 a.m. before fading in the dawn light. Mars is back later this month after completing its pass behind the Sun. It will rise in the east after about 4 a.m. after about... how can you use those two words? East it is rising in the east about 4 a.m. before it, it too becomes lost in the early morning twilight. Uh, Jupiter, soon to move behind the Sun, uh, remains visible in the west this month from 9pm before setting around 11pm early in the month and then progressively earlier until the end of the month it will set around 10.45pm. Saturn is no longer visible. That's it, it's blown up, gone away and never to be seen again. No, not exactly. Uh, Saturn is no longer visible, but after it takes a pass behind the Sun, it will appear in the east in the morning skies in March. Meteors. This month's most active shower is the Quadranids. Uh, it is a northern hemisphere shower, uh, peaking on the 4th. Uh, in the southern hemisphere, it is in the southern hemisphere is Eta Carinids, Carinids, active from 14th to the 27th of January, with typically faint meteors of only about two or three per hour as it peaks, it peaks on today, <laughs> the 21st. Um, so that's the Eta Carinids, active from the 14th to the 27th, but it peaks today. Tomorrow morning would be probably a good time for amateurs to do some meteor scatter. This shower is centered near the faint star Eta Carina, located near the Southern Cross. It is high in the south, midnight to dawn, an ideal time for meteor observing. Get to it. Uh, now, the International Space Station. Let's have a quick look at those dates. That's no good. Oh, here we are. If you haven't seen the International Space Station go across the sky, it orbits every 90 minutes at an average distance of 400 kilometers above the Earth. Um, and there's a chance to see uh, the International Space Station on Monday, uh, the 24th. If you get up early enough and the, the sky is clear, I think it will be actually, I think we're in for some very good weather over the next few days until Wednesday next week. Uh, so Monday the 24th at 5.19 a.m. 5.19 a.m. to 5.24 a.m. coming in from the north, northwest to the east, south, east. It's a pity they don't exactly tell you uh, in this how high above the horizon because um, that could be 20, 30 degrees above the horizon so you'd, you'd need a clear view but I think I think these predictions take in the, the best uh, visible path so uh, Monday 24th 
20 past 9 to about 25 past. Uh, and then Thursday, the 27th, there's a passing at 9.27am to 9.31am coming in from the east northeast to the southeast. Heavens Above gives predictions for visible passes of space stations and major satellites. Uh, live sky views and 3D visualizations. Be sure to be the first to enter your local. Be sure to first enter your location under the configuration file um, to make sure that the, your information is more accurate to where you're located. <clears throat> but uh, yeah, if uh, if you want information about what's uh, above our heads, both celestial and what's orbiting the sky, heavensabove.com is the site to go to been around for a while. Alright, time is 16 past the hour. Time is already getting away. Uh, just a quick look there. What else? What else? There's a lot of here. There's a lot of here. There's another 10 minutes worth of reading. I will uh, won't worry about that. But I'll read out a few dates. Um, <clears throat> on this day, not today, but on the 1st of January 1801, the first asteroid um, Sears was discovered by Gillespie Parzi, Parzi, Z, however you pronounce that name. Sears. Did I get that pronunciation right on that one? I always get that mixed up. Sears or Sears or Sears, I don't know. Anyway, that was uh, the 1st of January 1801, the first asteroid Sears was discovered. <laughs> Let's get it wrong. The 2nd of January 1959 was the first detection of solar wind by Lunar 1 as it passed the moon. 1959. On the 4th of January 1958, the first satellite Sputnik USSR fell back into the atmosphere and disintegrated after 11 years, sorry, 11 weeks uh, in orbit. <laughs> 11 weeks that was. 1958. Also on the 4th of January 1959, uh, the first human-made object enters heliocentric orbit, which was Luna 1. And uh, also on the 4th of January 1643, birth of Isaac Newton, famous for the studies in optics, the reflecting telescope, laws of gravitation and motion, and co-creator of calculus. So you can blame him for the calculus in this world. Uh, <laughs> and uh, talking about gravity, uh, in just a short moment, once, once I get past all this, we've got a very interesting little thing on gravity, uh, courtesy of Scott Manley, and uh, which I'll go into in just a short moment or two. Um, but uh, I'll just get, get through this first of all. And uh, all right, uh, and uh, where was I? The optics, uh, heliocentric, Isaac Newton. Uh, on the 5th of January 2005, discovery of the most massive and second largest dwarf planet, uh, Eris, uh, at 2,300 kilometer diameter, uh, by the team led by Mike Brown at the Polymer Observatory. That was the 5th of January 2005, discovery of the most massive and second largest dwarf planet. On the 8th of January 1942, birth of Stephen Hawking, theoretical physicist, cosmologist and science celebrity, 1942. Um, the 11th of January 1787, discovery of Uranus's first two moons, uh, Titania and uh, Oberon, uh, by William Herschel. And uh, I'll make this the last date. The Sure that's all about. The 16th of January 1969, first docking in space and first crew exchange in space between Soyuz 4 and Soyuz 5 in Earth orbit. And one more, the 18th of uh, January 1961, a meteorite falls onto occupied house in Baxter, Missouri in the USA. A very rare thing that is. Oh, there's a few, more, just a couple more things here. I like the dates on the 19th of January, coming up to the 21st. The 19th of uh, January, 2006, New Horizons spacecraft USA launched to Pluto for its 2015 flyby. 
and uh, we'll just go to the next one the 23rd of January 2003 the final communication with Pioneer 10 the first interplanetary probe to Jupiter which later left the solar system and from there uh, I'll segue to uh, coming up to the James Webb Telescope how, how good is the James Webb Telescope <laughs> before I talk about the James uh, I'd like to also mention that um, just out of interest this is something that kind of came up at the uh, the coffee break net this morning on 1825 and g'day to anybody from the coffee break net Steve is probably listening all the other guys are probably in bed tucked up asleep um, <laughs> Uh, you've got Pioneer 10 in in order of um, uh, of exploration probes that are out there in deep space. Uh, you've got Pioneer 10, which was launched in 1972, flew past Jupiter in 1973, and is heading in the direction of Aldebaran, 65 light years away in the constellation of Taurus. Contact was lost in January 2003 and it is estimated to have passed 120 astronomical units. So Pioneer 10 is the furthest object, uh, man-made object that's off into space and uh, as it says they lost contact with it on January 2003. Next in the list is Pioneer 11 launched in 1973, flew past Jupiter in 74 and Saturn in 79. Contact was lost in November 1995 and it is estimated to be around 100 AU. The spacecraft is headed toward the constellation of Aquila, northwest of the constellation of Sagittarius. Um, barring an incident, Pioneer 11 will pass near one of the stars in the constellation in about 4 million years. So that's worth waiting around for. Voyager 2, launched in August 1977, flew past Jupiter in 1979, Saturn in 1981, Uranus in 1986, and then Neptune in 1989. The probe left the heliosphere for interstellar space at 119 AU on the 5th of November 2018. Voyager 2 is still active. It is not headed toward any particular star, although in roughly 40,000 years it should pass 1.7 light years from the star Ross 248. If undisturbed for 296,000 years, it should pass by the star Ceres, um, Ceres at a distance of 4.3 light years. So that's just going out there. No, we're particular. And uh, Voyager 2, so, and then there's uh, Voyager 1. Uh, Voyager 1 launched September 1977. It flew past Jupiter in 79 and Saturn in 1980, making a special close approach of Saturn's moon Titan. The probe passed the heliopause at 121 AU on the 25th of August 2012 to enter interstellar space. Voyager 1 is still active, as mentioned. It is headed towards an encounter with the star Galice 445, which lies 17.6 light years from Earth in around 40,000 years. Then, of course, you've got New Horizons. New Horizons was launched in 2006. The probe flew past Jupiter in 2007 and Pluto on the 14th of July 2015. It flew past the Kuiper Belt. Uh, it, it, uh, it flew past a Kuiper Belt object which was known as 486958 Arrokoth on January 1, 2019 as part of the Kuiper Belt extended mission. And as we speak New Horizons is still uh, headed out there and uh, the um, Deep Sky Network is, uh, is actually in Canberra is actually currently tracking a, a signal from it. Uh, okay, so there you go. 
the average speed for all these uh, spacecraft that are out there, Voyager 1, uh, is currently travelling at 17 kilometres a second. Pioneer 10, 11.9 kilometres a second. Voyager 2, 15.3 kilometres a second. Uh, Pioneer 11, travelling at 11.2 kilometres a second. And New Horizons is moving along at 13.8 kilometres a second. Most attaining. And uh, yes, if you type in um, Deep Space Network um, in your favourite search engine, you will see the link to something called Space Network Now and it will show a graphic of various radio telescopes or dish antenna um, that are tracking various objects and uh, in fact I'm just checking that page right now and uh, the uh, dish number 43 at Canberra was looking at Voyager 2 but it's currently not uh, but it is there are two, two uh, radio dishes at Canberra Deep Space Network that are doing uh, tracking the uh, James Webb Telescope. And the current radio time for the James Webb Telescope is about 8 seconds uh, communication time for your, if you're interested in knowing that. 8.96 8 seconds it takes for a radio signal to get to the James Webb Telescope. So where is the James Webb Telescope if you may ask? Oh, the time's getting away. Um, well, it's uh, currently uh, almost coming up to 27 days uh, on its journey after leaving uh, Earth. And uh, as I said before, it was very, very successful, uh, this uh, launch. I'm, I'm really happy, like everybody else is, that the launch went uh, um, without any problems. And uh, it is fully deployed. The sh sun shields are out. The mirror has been uh, expanded and the... Um, the focal point has been uh, fitted into place. All went without a hitch, and uh, I think the uh, I think where it is at the moment is that it's um, uh, the uh, sun shields uh, are being tensioned. Uh, so I think that's where we are right now. In fact, what do they say here? Uh, mirror segment deployment completed. Uh, this completes the multi-day a multi-day multi-step activity to activate and move each of the 18 primary mirror segments and secondary mirrors out of their launch configuration. The primary mirror segments were driven 12.5 millimeters away from the telescope structure using six motors that deploy each segment approximately half the length of, the, of a paper clip. These uh, actuators clear the mirror, uh, clear the mirrors from their launch restraints and give each segment enough space to later be adjusted in their in other directions to the optical starting position uh, for up and coming wavefront alignment process. The 18 radius of curvature or ROC actuators were moved from their launch position as well even against the beryllium's strength uh, which is six times greater than that, that of steel these ROC actuators individually shape the curvature of each mirror segment to set the initial parabolic shape of the primary mirror. So next up in the wave front process we'll be moving mirrors in the micron and nanometer ranges to reach their final optical positions for an aligned and um, for a, an aligned telescope. The process of the telescope alignment will take approximately three months. So uh, yes, we're about uh, three days, two and a half days from the insertion point at Lagrange 2 um, location, which is 1.5 million kilometers um, past or further past from the moon, from the Earth to and by the moon to the Lagrange point L2. So uh, yes. Um, Again, if you're interested, if you haven't uh, discovered that, if you type in where is James Webb Telescope uh, in your search engine, you'll find very quickly find uh, the page that I am looking at, which shows you the timeline and uh, the various stages of the telescope. So we're only a, a couple of days away from the insertion of James Webb Telescope, but uh, however, we still have to wait um, probably about another three months or so uh, before we probably get to see the first light scenario
Okay, you're tuned to VK3 EKH. I keep forgetting to introduce and say the call sign. Better do that. <laughs> this is ASV Radio, <clears throat> VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel, the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria with their first broadcast uh, for 2022. <sighs> okay, now it's 10.30 already. So what I'll do... Um, I was surfing on the internet the other day, which is just about every day, in fact, and I always get stuck on YouTube. There is so much interesting stuff on YouTube uh, that I came across a chap, and I've actually seen this bloke quite a few times already. His name's Scott Manley, and uh, Scott Manley is uh, someone who fell into YouTube because he felt a deep, compelling need to teach people orbital mechanics and rocket science so they could play Ker Kerbal Space Program. I'm not sure what that is. But now, years later, the gaming videos are less, less important to him and uh, the pure science is the main thrust. He says, my degrees are all in physics and astronomy. So much of the rocket science and engineering I've learned is self-taught always learning, always teaching. He says, I'm not a professional YouTuber. Uh, I have a day job in software development, which means I won't take t lame, uh, I won't take lame sponsored content or tell you to sign up or affiliate services to make a quick buck. And that's a bit like what I do here too. However, <laughs> however, lots of generous people have asked to support my hobby via the Patreon thing that they all do. And of course, any any uh, um, donations, of course, uh, are appreciated. No worries, Scott. Uh, anyway, I sent a, Scott an email um, via YouTube just the other day because I, I came across a a, a, a sixteen minute uh, YouTube thing he did, a video clip thing, and uh, I, it was rather impressive. Now, it's best that you, for if you're not. Um, looking at YouTube, um, it's probably a good idea to catch the YouTube channel because a lot of it's visual. <clears throat> but, um, and for those who are watching ATV, it should be cool. Uh, but uh, he's given me permission to uh, to play the video, so that's not a problem there, I don't believe. And he's actually quite a, quite happy for me if I, if I find any of his other uh, video clips of, the, of educational value. Um, and of course, of course it will be. <laughs> um, then he's uh, happy for me to uh, run that as well so I'll have to uh, to check on all that um, but what I'll do is uh, I'll just quickly go to my vmix program and just queue up this thing and if it all works as planned and it probably won't <laughs> but we should be able to run this uh, 15 minute little thing that he's got and uh, it's um, it's actually, uh, let me see, um, anyway, it's about uh, gravity um, and uh, uh, generating artificial gravity uh, in space stations and rotating sections and uh, some of the tests that have been done uh, in, the, uh, in history uh, in NASA and elsewhere uh, about uh, gravity effects on, uh, on, on uh, the body. So uh, it's very interesting to, see, to, uh, to hear what he has to say. Uh, about that. So this is VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel, ASV Radio, with a regular Friday night broadcast. Let's see if we can get this running without too many hiccups. Uh, just uh, let's see if we can do this. Um, I have to turn up the volume on this. Turn this down. Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Today I want to talk to you about artificial gravity. Artificial gravity is of course a staple of science fiction, partly because if you're shooting a TV show or movie it makes shooting scenes on Earth a whole lot easier. But in the early days of spaceflight there were lots of concerns about the human body's reaction to zero-g, to the point that Yuri Gagarin would have to input a three-digit code to unlock the controls on Vostok 1, just in case being in zero-g made him space crazy. While the first decade of human spaceflight showed that humans could easily adapt to zero-g for short missions, 
There were many reasons to think that for longer missions, say on space stations, it would be a good idea to have access to artificial gravity capabilities for the sake of the long-term health of the crew. Specifically, it was known, even with a week or so of exposure, that the human body will slowly lose muscle and bone mass in the absence of gravity. On the engineering side of things, the laws of physics give us three ways to generate gravity-style forces for a crew. Uh, but only one of these is actually viable for spaceflight, rotational artificial gravity. You see, gravity is a phenomenally weak um, phenomenon. And while science fiction loves artificial gravity generators in the floors of spacecraft, again because it makes it easy to shoot and because it lets you design cool spaceships, there's nothing in the laws of physics that would imply or suggest that this is possible. The only way that we know right now to generate a gravity field is with a huge amount of mass, such as a planet. Planet-sized chunks of mass are great for living on, but they're kind of inconvenient to carry along if you're doing spaceflight. Now, another, another way to do this is linear acceleration, where you're going faster in a straight line. And that does indeed generate the perception of, real, uh, of gravity. Indeed, Einstein built general relativity by assuming that accelerating in a straight line and planetary gravity should be identical and no experiment can tell them apart. And guess what? That works pretty well. Now, spaceflight is great for generating linear accelerations, but you only get a few minutes during launch and re-entry. Those chemical rocket engines can deliver the g-forces you need, but only for minutes before their propellant is depleted. In TV shows like The Expanse, the spacecraft use fusion drives that can accelerate for days on end without running out of propellant. But that's a technology that is driven by the needs of the plot, and it may never be possible with uh, human technology. Also, uh, the magnetic boots that we see in the show are, again, really nice if you're trying to shoot a TV show, but uh, they really just provide a way to secure your feet to a surface without actually providing the gravity loads that make the human body work out and uh, you know, decondition. So, rotational gravity is what's left, right? That's the only one that's possible. And indeed, the idea of large rotating space stations was around for decades before anybody ever flew in space. But a lifetime later, and we still don't see rotating space stations. Although there are many people who would love to build one, such as the Voyager space station. So, a quick reminder of the math that this involves. If you have an object that is moving in a circle, you need a force pushing it inwards towards the middle. And that force has to be proportional to the mass, the radius of the circle, multiplied by the angular velocity squared. And in physics, we measure angular velocity in radians per second. So there's you know, two pi radians in a complete circle in two, 360 degrees. So now if you want to generate an Earth-like 9.8 meters per second of gravity with a 10 meter radius structure, that's about 30 feet, then you need to rotate it at about one radian per second or about nine and a half RPM. If you make the radius longer, then the rotation rate gets smaller, and if you reduce the gravity that you want, then similarly you can use lower rotation rates. Now at this point, I should put on my physics tutor hat and explain the difference between centripetal and centrifugal forces. For an object to move in a circle, it has to have that centripetal force pushing it towards the center of rotation. But if you are a person in a rotating space station with walls and you can't see out, um, what this force to you appears as the plate pushing the ground plate pushing up against you. You feel a centrifugal force pulling you down towards the floor, and that feels like gravity. But this is different, equal and opposite. It, it look it's different enough that it can serve as a limitless source of pedantry from physicists. So anyway, this kind of construction is of course used in training pilots and astronauts. You have the centrifuge facility. This is to give pilots a high experience in high G loads on the ground. You know, you'll put them in a test cabin or a test car, spin it around at high speeds and generate the G forces that they need to learn to handle, you know, to make sure that the body is capable, that the G suit works properly, and just to teach them adaptation techniques to moments when they're dealing with this. But this kind of training is something that lasts for hours rather than the weeks or months that astronauts might experience on the space station. So, you know, this kind of rotational 
facility is well understood by the spaceflight community. And that meant that it was also known that there were side effects from spinning humans around like this. I mean, it's honestly something we learn as kids, right? You get very dizzy if you spin around too fast. And turning those childish understanding and perceptions of dizziness and falling over into quantifiable research on human physiology is a serious endeavour that requires lots of effort, resources and dealing with people being sick. So there's two main effects that we see when humans operate in a rotating environment. Firstly, your body uses the semicircular canals near your ears to detect rotation and that helps you keep your balance. And they do this by detecting the motion of fluid in these sort of circular um, uh, cavities. And this responds to the rotation of, the, you know, of your head. Now, if you're sitting perfectly still, your brain will take that as a non-moving reference frame and you'll stop getting dizzy if you're, even if you're rotating. But if you're returning your head, then you expect a certain rotation. If the room is turning and you turn your head, you will get a different rotation and that will confuse your brain and that will, is a great way to give yourself motion sickness. One of the first things that people learn to do in rotational experiments is to stop moving their head to minimize this effect. And the other thing is, in a rotating environment, any motion through that will frequently require forces that are different from the same motion in a non-rotating environment. These are broadly described as the Coriolis forces, which at planetary scales affect the atmospheric motions and help make tropical storms that rotate counterclockwise north of the equator and clockwise in the south. But at high rotation rates, simply reaching out your hand to pick up something might result in the fictional Coriolis force pushing your arm away from the path that your brain has planned for. You know, your brain is working with its previous experience and all your motor functions to balance this out. So when this happens, your motor control system needs to relearn how to perform these basic tasks. And you, you can learn a specific motion really quickly, minutes even. But then, you know, in some rotational environments, if you turn to face a different direction or move your hand in a different direction, the Coriolis force will again be different and you need further adaptation. It takes days to become fully adapted to a rotating environment. So one question that scientists wanted to answer was what kind of rotation rates can the human body handle for long durations? Long enough to get over that initial sickness, long enough that the gravity would need to be, uh, would be needed to avoid deconditioning of the body. Can people perform at the same levels as they do in a non-rotating environment? Or is there some penalty uh, that can't be eliminated by training at any rotation rate? Is there an upper limit on the rotating conditions that human can handle? Um, because that in turn, if you've got a limit on your rotation rates, that will set the minimum radius for a spacecraft that is using rotational artificial gravity. Now, one of the problem with all the studies like this is that they're interested in hypothetical rotating structures in space, but they have to take place on Earth. And you can't subtract Earth's gravity because we don't have anti-gravity. So one type of test is the rotating room, where a room is rotated around its vertical axis like this. And you might actually have seen this on YouTube. There's a video with Tom Scott that uh, does this. But these have been around for a long time. The US Naval Medical Research Laboratory built the slow rotating room facility in 1958. That was like 10 meters across. And they had living quarters in there for long duration testing. So people would live in there for weeks on end. At one RPM, people could operate with very little adaptation, but most subjects would begin to suffer motion sickness initially when uh, the room was spinning at about three RPM. Again, turning your head was the thing that would really trip off motor si motion sickness. But from that, people could adapt uh, as you spun the room faster and faster, and they could learn to handle much higher rotation rates, even up to 10 RPM, although quite a few people couldn't adapt and ended up making frequent use of the sick bags. Yeah. Now, in the Soviet Union, again, they did similar experiments using rotating rooms and they came to the same conclusions. But the rotating room isn't the same as a spacecraft rotating to provide artificial gravity because the axis of rotation is uh, in a spacecraft is parallel to the floor, but you can't do that on Earth because of the ever-present gravity of the Earth. However, there have been tests on large centrifuges with whole living spaces at the end with a rotation rate fast enough to incline the floor to provide a non-sloping surface for the occupants. And this means not only is the space rotating, 
but you're also dealing with stronger gravity. So you had better be sure that you are not going to fall over because if you fall over due to your lack of balance, you're going to hit the ground a lot harder in these environments. So this footage here is from a Soviet experiment where, again, people would live for about a week at a time. And one of the more amusing demonstrations is the arrow throwing, where they curve around thanks to the Coriolis force. Although the elevator system uh, is also another interesting thing because, you know, you want to bring out the doctor to the crew to study them. But moving radial is really hard because, you know, your gravity forces and everything are rapidly changing as you move down this arm. It's one of the more disorienting experiences. NASA also had a very large centrifuge system. It's called the Rotating Test Facility, and it was built by Rockwell out in California. Uh, so on one side, there was this living area. It was like 40 feet long by 10 feet wide. It was actually a section of an aircraft, apparently. And people would live in this for about a week at a time. The other side, they counterbalanced this by having the walking wall. And this was a vertical wall and they had straps to support people so they could actually stand sideways on this and test walking like let you know, prograde and or counter rotation, right? They could also use this same support harness system to simulate ascending and descending ladders. Because again, that's another thing that was quite complicated for your body to learn. But the only experiment I've seen that's really flown in space and provided artificial gravity is the Soviet Bion 3 or Cosmos 782 mission. So that had a small centrifuge on board it and they had plants and animals in containers at different distances from the rotation axis and that allowed them to compare different simulated gravitational environments. And as far as I can tell, this is the most significant test of artificial gravity ever flown in space. It's also notable as the first time a US experiment flew on a Soviet space mission. The spacecraft was actually based on the Zenit design, which was a Soviet photo reconnaissance satellite that shared a lot in common with Vostok because back in the 50s and 60s when Sergei Korolev was developing this, he realized he could get money from the people that wanted a human spacecraft and from the people who wanted a spy satellite and build them one spacecraft, right? Um, so yeah, all of this stuff, went on for decades and the huge reports that were compiled for all these experiments and what they all basically say is slower is better but rotational artificial gravity is possible in structures that are comparable to the size of the international space station there would be a few engineering problems to solve to make sure like the thing remained balanced and you have you know proper seals and transitions but you know, there's nothing insurmountable there instead we don't see rotating space stations because there's no real selling point since the same intense medical research has helped develop ways to stave off the deconditioning associated with zero G through consistent exercise to make up for the body not supporting your weight doing mundane things in zero G. The ISS is primarily concerned with zero G research and that kind of research is hard to do in a rotating station. You would need a non-rotating section. But the ISS does miss out on the ability to perform experiments at lower gravity levels than those on Earth. I mean, at one point, there was a centrifuge facility planned for the ISS, very similar to that found in the Bion 3 satellite. And that would allow small biological payloads to be exposed for lower gravity for long periods of time. But ultimately, this was cut to make the space station more affordable. But you know, with the new wave of space tourism, there's suddenly a number of people who are interested in going into space and may find the idea of staying in space for a while, taking in the views, and who don't need experiments that are in carefully controlled microgravity. So maybe the idea of a rotating space station will finally return. In the movie 2001 A Space Odyssey, the rotating space station 5 at the start, the interiors, we get to see lounges, restaurants and a hotel. It's not a science facility. So maybe the only thing Arthur C. Clarke got wrong was the date. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe. <laughs> Don't call it out on that one. Um, <laughs> thank you, Scott. <coughs> this is VK3 EKH. Oops, audio. Right, we're back. We're back. 
Um, oh, look for Mike, uh, Mike going down. Don't you didn't hear that? That's good. All right. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Scott uh, Manuel, for for uh, for that interesting video, and uh, look uh, look forward to uh, to running uh, Scott uh, video in the near future as well because he's got a heap of stuff like that. In fact, I, I, I think he actually did a, a video on the collapse of the Arecibo telescope. That's where I first uh, uh, saw uh, uh, Scott's uh, interesting video. So um, I might try and find that and uh, play that maybe uh, maybe next week. Anyway, um, I've just got enough time to squeeze in the latest uh, from uh, Tamitha uh, Scope on the, the latest with Space Weather Woman. And uh, if you're a shortwave uh, or um, a DX uh, hound, uh, the information that she has here is often pertinent to uh, our conditions, uh, ionospheric conditions, even though this is a few days old. I think her, her prediction ends on today, actually. Um, but uh, nevertheless, uh, it's always interesting to, uh, to, to listen to what's been happening up in about with our sun. So this is VK3EKH and uh, stand by for uh, Tamitha. Let's see if that's ready to go and let's see if we can do this. With seven active regions on the Earth facing disk and more about to rotate into view, a solar storm that's ongoing at Earth and one more on the way, our sun is getting busy. Those stories and more in the news this week. This space weather forecast is sponsored in part by Millersville University. Come get certified in broadcast space weather. Visit millersville.edu slash swen. Space weather this week is picking up and it's on the lively side. As we take a look at our Earth facing disk, you can see two bands of active regions, one in the north and one in the south, and that tells you solar cycle 25 is well underway. In fact, back on the 14th, whammo, did you see that? That was region 2925 and it launched a partially Earth directed solar storm off to our west. Too bad though it was westward of this big coronal hole, which has also been sending us some fast solar wind, and that wind has likely deflected that solar storm off further to the west so that it's missed Earth entirely. But you know what? No matter. The fast wind from this coronal hole has actually bumped us up to storm levels. In fact, for a few hours, it bumped us up to G2 level solar storm conditions, and that gave us some beautiful aurora for a very short bit, even in some places down at mid-latitudes. Meanwhile, as it, these regions continue to rotate, you can look whammo on the 16th. We cut region 2929 firing off yet another solar storm that's partially earth directed this one however is on the east side of that coronal hole and likely that fast solar wind now could actually deflect this one into earth so we could be having a yet another solar storm that's earth directed but we're waiting for coronagraphs to give us a confirmation Meanwhile, on top of all of that, we actually have even more regions that are going to be rotating into Earth view here in the next couple days. We have region 2932, and that was firing off some big solar storms on the sun's far side. And we have another region that's just about to rotate into view, and even one more in the south. And those from Stereo's view are also solar storm producers. So we could have some real fun here over the next week, and including the boosting of that solar flux up into triple digits, amateur radio operators and emergency responders are also enjoying some good propagation. Switching to our M-flare threat meter, as you can see, the X-ray flux back around the 10th or so was still a bit on the quiet side, but as we began to move into about the 12th and even the 13th, you can see that X-ray flux begin to rise and a bit of flare activity. Well, that solar flux also rose right on with it. We are now back into the triple digits for solar flux, and this means good propagation on Earth's day side for amateur radio operators and emergency responders, and yet it will be a bit noisy on the bands because you, you can see we do have a bit of flare activity. On the 14th, we did have an M-class flare with a short radio blackout for a little bit. That was when we had that first of the two solar storms that I showed you being launched. Since then, though, it's only been C-class flares. However, we do still have about a 20% chance of M-flares, so this is going to last easily over the next few days, and we have more regions rotating into Earth view, so expect these conditions to continue easily over this next week. 
switching to our solar storm conditions, as you can see, we were pretty quiet until about the 8th when we got hit by a pocket of fast solar wind that bumped us up to storm levels. So if you happen to be a, a, a person who is a fan of, let's say, Steve Hawking or, I don't know, Elvis or even David Bowie, the sun was celebrating their birthdays right along with you. Then, uh, sadly, it didn't last too long before things went kind of quiet again, but that only was until the 14th when we got hit by yet a larger pocket of fast solar wind and and wham, that bumped us up not only to storm levels, but up to G2 level storm conditions. And that brought us some gorgeous aurora for a short while down into mid latitudes, but it really didn't last all that long. So if you've been an aurora chaser over the past couple days, as you can see, it's kind of been stumbling and bumbling along. It really hasn't been easy to catch that aurora. It's been pretty uh, sporadic. And these conditions will continue over the next day or so before things really begin to settle down. But then and we do have that other solar storm that might glance uh, Earth right around the 20th or so. We'll have to kind of wait to see what the models show us. But that might bring us yet another chance for a little bit of an aurora show as the week continues. So what else does our sun have in store for us this week? Well, this is Stereo A. It's our partially far-sighted monitor. You can see here's Earth, here's the sun, and here's Stereo A staring at the sun just a little bit from the side. And as we take a look at Stereo A's view, especially if we focus on the east limb, you can see we've got a lot of new active regions that are pretty busy on the east limb. In fact, region 2932 that's just now rotated into Earth view, this region was a big solar storm producer on the sun's far side. Side. Right now it looks though that it's kind of quieting down a little bit. We'll see if it picks up again. But the region just behind it in the north, that region also looks like it could be a solar storm producer. And yet we have another region, uh, that's old region 2916 in the south, and that region also looks like it could be a solar storm producer. So you aurora photographers, if you haven't been able to get any aurora shots with this recent solar storm, don't worry. It looks like you're going to get more chances here either this week or possibly into next week. And amateur radio operators, well, good news for you as well. The solar flux should stay in the triple digits easily over this next week and possibly over next week. And that means good radio propagation on Earth's day side. Switching to our moon, we are now passing through the full moon with a full moon on the 17th. And even by the 23rd, the moon will still be about 75% illuminated. So you night sky watchers, if you want to catch those dim objects in the sky, you've got this bright companion you're going to have to deal with. So be sure to check your local rise and set times. Switching to our solar storm conditions and aurora possibilities over the coming week, we are in the middle of that fast solar wind from that coronal hole that's rotated in through the Earth strike zone, and we're going to be continuing to feel the effects of this over the next couple days. At high latitudes, NOAA is expecting storm levels with up to about a 50% chance of a major storm, and that will calm down about midweek. Now, at mid latitudes, we're only expecting unsettled conditions, but we do have up to about a 15% chance of a minor storm. And again, these conditions should settle down as we move through the week, but we do have that other solar storm that is partially Earth-directed, and we could get a little glancing blow from that, and that could bump us up to storm levels again, especially at high latitudes. But we're still waiting for those models. It's pretty early to make those predictions yet. So just expect that this, the quiet conditions as we move into the end of this upcoming week could possibly actually pop back up and give us more storming. Switching to our solar flare and particle radiation storm outlook over the coming week, believe it or not, with all these active regions on the Earth-facing disk, not everything is in the green. We actually do have some M-flare players on the Earth-facing disk. NOAA is giving us about a 20% chance of an M-class flare over the next couple days, with the main player being region 2929. We also have a little bit of M-flare risk from region 2930, but those two regions are going to be rotated off on the sun's west limb here in the next few days. So that M flare risk may begin to, to quiet down just a bit. However, we do have those new regions rotating into Earth view over the next couple days. And once we get a better look at them, that might increase that M flare risk again. So welcome to solar cycle 25. It looks like big flares are, might actually be here to stay. And the nice thing is that we're going to be getting that solar flux back up into the triple digits and keeping it there 
possibly for the duration. Wouldn't it be nice if we don't drop back down to double digits? This means we will be having decent radio propagation on Earth's day side, despite the fact that we have a risk for radio blackouts. Now, GPS users, I know you're not really happy about the increased flux and the, uh, the risk for radio blackouts, so just stay vigilant, especially near dawn and near dusk. So the space weather this week is definitely on the lively side. We do have a coronal hole that's rotating through the Earth strike zone now, and it's been sending us some fast solar wind, and that has bumped us to storm levels multiple times, and it could easily do so again over the next 24 to 48 hours. So Aurora photographers, if you're at high latitudes, you could easily get some more shows. Now, if you're at mid latitudes, your Aurora photographers, well, it may be a bit of a, a sporadic or a fleeting show, so only if if you're dedicated should you chase now amateur radio operators and emergency responders well you know we've got triple digits back when it comes to that solar flux and it looks like it's going to continue to stay that way easily over this week and next week with, with the new regions that are rotating into earth view so radio propagation on earth's day side should continue to stay in the good range and as long as you can get through the the issues with that solar storm that has been you know causing some havoc on the night side well just hang in there things will get better now you gps users well you know i'm sure you don't like the the fact that the solar flux is actually back in the triple digits that does cause GPS reception down at low latitudes to be a bit dicey and I'm sure you don't really like the fact that we've got a few M flare players on the earth facing disk as well so that means radio blackouts may be something you have to deal with so as long as you stay away from the dawn dust terminators and away from Aurora while this solar storm is raging your GPS reception should be uh, pretty decent, but also remember, stay away from those low latitude regions if you can, especially near dawn and near dusk. I'm Tamitha Scove, the Space Weather Woman. Thank you for watching. Thanks, Tamitha, for uh, the solar report for the week that's been at least, and uh, quite possibly what's, uh, what's coming up in the uh, the next uh, week a lot of her reports uh, come out uh, at, uh, on a Sunday or a Monday morning and uh, uh, of course me with the broadcast here on a Friday night it kind of doesn't quite gel nevertheless anyway this is VK3 EKH uh, ASV radio uh, all right now we're coming up to uh, to uh, conclude um, just having a quick look at spaceweather.com uh, what's current with spaceweather.com at least. Um, the solar wind is at uh, 410.1 kilometers per second at a density of 2.4 protons per cubic centimeter. There's currently four sunspots visible on the disk of the sun at this stage. Uh, the sunspot number is uh, currently 60 and the radio sun uh, measured at a wavelength of 10.7 centimeters as uh, a flux yeah. 10.7 centimeter wavelength the uh, current flux is 99 solar flux units I think that's about it um, they've got here and uh, of course I always like to mention the uh, potentially hazardous asteroids as of the 21st of January 2022 uh, there are 2,252 potentially hazardous asteroids so that's uh, spaceweather.com. Um, all right. Uh, I want to thank uh, everybody that's uh, come in on the, the uh, uh, chat window, um, starting from uh, Richard at the top there. Uh, we have, um, go down, go down, just where are we? Yep. So Richard VK3VRS, Martin VK7JAH, and Dave VK3JL. I'm not sure if you're still listening there, Dave, but uh, thanks for coming in there. Um, Bill VK3 KHT um, and uh, uh, um, 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 Bruce VK3 MN, g'day Bruce uh, and uh, Cassiopeia, g'day Nebs and I think that's about it on the chat window um, I might also mention that uh, I haven't got anything to show here um, with the uh, volcanic explosion last uh, Saturday um, at, at just near, near Tonga um, a very interesting observation uh, was made uh, by uh, Dave, VK3JL, 
and he posted on his Facebook page a, a barometric chart uh, which showed a blip um, on the, uh, the pressure uh, gradient and um, that turns out to be the uh, pressure wave or shock wave produced by the volcanic uh, eruption. I then very quickly looked at my own weather station and sure enough we saw the same uh, pressure gradient, sudden change in pressure uh, at around 10 past 7 on Saturday night. Uh, I then queried uh, with uh, Tony VK3VAT and Graham VK3GL and they both confirmed uh, uh, the same blip on the radar. <laughs> Um, as it turns out, um, this uh, pressure wave that uh, travelled at maybe a, a thousand kilometres uh, uh, an hour type uh, speed or something like that, um, uh, transfers to most of the, uh, the globe. Uh, it was picked up by weather stations, the barometric pressure, uh, uh, sudden, sudden change, uh, as far as uh, the United Kingdom and uh, Alaska. Uh, one of our uh, friends over in, in uh, Anchorage, uh, uh, with Whitlam Reeve, his weather stations also detected the blip uh, as far as uh, uh, Alaska. So it was a very interesting little phenomenon to see. And uh, I'm, I'm glad to say that uh, even though this volcanic eruption occurred quite some distance away, um, it still had its effects far and wide, one way or another. Um, yeah, pretty amazing uh, explosion that one and uh, a bit disastrous though the uh, tsunamis that occurred on the local islands and uh, uh, of course uh, the effects on Tonga so um, not good there but um, quite an amazing uh, uh, event that one. Anyway, um, having said that uh, we shall conclude transmissions for, and this is the, like I said this is the first uh, uh, transmission for 2022 <coughs> so uh, apologies for going over time I didn't think I would but there you go you've been listening to Clint Jeffrey VK3CSJ uh, operating under the society's call sign of VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel transmitting since 1988 on these frequencies and uh, uh, thanks very much everybody for tuning in tonight uh, also I forgot, almost forgot to mention the uh, folks that sent me emails um, thanks Don for your uh, report there uh, appreciate the good signal reports on 80 and 160 um, and YouTube as well and uh, we have a, a, an email coming in from Andrew VK3KIS G'day Andrew um, he's uh, listening to the YouTube stream um, while he's also looking through his telescope uh, at the Orion Nebula as we speak well that was probably about an hour ago <laughs> Anyway, uh, thanks Andrew, and we also have a report from Ian, VK3VIN, uh, g'day Ian, and he says uh, 80's a little bit up and down, uh, still nothing heard on 160, uh, but uh, in general uh, things seem to be okay at the moment, uh, and uh, from uh, Mr Lewis, uh, Graham, VK3GL, who uh, reports that he likes the haircut, so thank you Graham. Um, he's currently at work. <laughs> so there it is, a quick rundown of who and who's not listening. Um, you've been listening to VK3 ASV, sorry, the VK3 EKH ASV radio, that's what I was trying to say, for the first uh, transmission for 22. Uh, we'll be back again next Friday at 10 o'clock to do it all again. And uh, let's hope that we can uh, continue on with the interesting, uh, uh, interesting stuff. So, uh, we shall conclude transmissions on our medium wave surface on 1865. There won't be any callback on 1865. So, thanks for the stations that have been <laughs> listening on 160. We conclude transmissions. Any information about the ASV can be found at www.asv.org.au. This is VK3 EKH, concluding transmission on 1865. Stations, stations on 80 metres, please stand by. All right, that's the transmitter off there. And uh, we have pen, pen, everything else is sort of kosher at this stage. So this is VK3 uh, EKH, uh, listening on 3541 for any stations wishing to check in.
oh, we had a bunch of stations at the start. I got VK3 HDX and VK3 JL. Uh, who were the stations that called in first? Beautiful. All right. Anybody else? VK3 EKH. Oh, not bad for the first uh, first callback. <laughs> Across to you there, Graham. VK3 GL in Bunyip. VK3 EKH. Yeah, good evening there, Cliff. VK3 EKH and uh, the uh, calling group, VK3 GL. Well, first things first, I guess. Uh, Graham, VK3GL, Bunyip, VK3CSJ, Nariwara and South. 5 and 9 plus 25, good solid signal from you there, Graham. Note that you're working, and uh, yes, uh, thanks for giving me the uh, the phone number to uh, con the hairdresser. Uh, so <laughs> it's just down the road. Um, yeah, anyway, no, if, you, if you had have seen me tonight without the uh, the hair trim, uh, you, you, I was looking a bit like Cousin It from uh, the Adams Family. So, <laughs> so I'm glad I got that sorted out. Anyway, thanks, Gray. Good to hear, mate. We, I, I don't know. We don't hear much on the repeater uh, at all, so I'm not really sure what's happening at your side of town. But uh, uh, I, I think you should come back to uh, to Berwick and um, uh, back onto that hill there, because uh, we heard you more often when you live locally than we do now um, at Bunyip. <laughs> anyway, not to worry. All right, thanks, Gray. Uh, across to you there, Don. VK3HDX. VK3EKH. Yeah, good on you, Don. VK3 HDX, VK3 EKH returning 5 and 9 plus 25. Um, very solid signal from you too, which is nothing unusual. Uh, thanks, Don. And uh, yeah, I agree. Even though the reports, uh, when I get a chance to play them, uh, might, might be a few days old, I, I think for, for most of us that have been doing any DX on on the, the shortwave bands would, uh, would appreciate uh, confirmation if anything, of uh, the conditions that uh, that have been over the last few days, just exactly as you've mentioned. So, um, 
uh, yeah, it's uh, it's all, all very good indeed. Um, thanks, Don. Good to hear, you. and um, uh, thanks for the report on uh, uh, on Scott too. Yes, he's a most interesting chap to listen to, and uh, I, a lot of the a lot of the YouTube uh, channels there they 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 carry on for the first five minutes, and then all of a sudden they say, "Oh, sponsor me, sponsor me, click like, and you know, do all this sort of stuff." And I think, "Oh my God, just get on with what you're talking about." None of this damn sponsorship stuff. So <laughs> that always annoys me. Um, <laughs> I don't. I don't care if there's only one or two people watching YouTube. Um, I, I'm not fussed about trying to create millions of uh, viewers. So uh, I don't know these these people. Anyway, that's another story. Um, <laughs> thanks, Don. Cross to Dave. I uh, hope you. Uh, I'm not kicking you off, mate. <laughs> VK3JL. Good to hear. VK3EKH. VK3JL, uh, VK3EKH VK3 returning. Yeah, you're hovering between uh, strength nine. You're not a, not a very strong signal here, <coughs> but uh, when you, you speak up, you suddenly you sort of kick up to 1520. Um, so well, you might be a little bit off the microphone, but um, uh, you basically you're averaging five and nine and occasionally picking up to 15 to 20 when you suddenly kind of speak up a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Nevertheless, uh, yeah, thanks Dave for calling him and um, uh, note that uh, about the uh, Mornington Peninsula uh, Astronomical Society too, doing great things down there. Uh, I keep I keep wanting to um, uh, approach someone, maybe yourself, I don't know, but uh, uh, I, I wouldn't mind the, at some stage setting up a, a, a Radio Jove receiver up there at the, that location uh, where you've got the telescope set up. Um, or some, at least some sort of suitable, suitable location that um, uh, the society there can also get involved with. Uh, I, that's, it's a thought that keeps crossing my mind uh, uh, many times, but I, I never really follow it up. But uh, it'd be just nice to have a um, another Radio Jove uh, set up, um, apart from the one uh, up at uh, Heathcote. Uh, operational, because uh, we, we need that sister station. Um, we ha we used to have. Uh, a, a station that we could uh, also rely on for doing Jupiter observations. Uh, one was that officer, uh, but that's long gone. And uh, there was also a station over at Hurstbridge, uh, Arthur's Creek. Uh, I, I don't know what the story is with that these days, but I, it's certainly uh, long gone as, as far as I know um, as well. So, uh, in fact, uh, the uh, the Radio Jove re station um, at Heathcote at the Leon Mal Dark Sky site is being relocated further away from the dish uh, because the electronics uh, that control the dish motion pr produce quite a lot of um, uh, RF noise and um, the chaps up there are relocating the antenna system this weekend in fact and um, hopefully the relocation will uh, be just far enough away uh, to uh, not pick up the uh, the noise from uh, all that uh, electronics that controls the dish. So that, that was a small issue, um, well not actually a small, it was actually a, a bit of a nuisance factor, but anyway there it is. Um, <laughs> but I, I, that's uh, another reason why I wouldn't mind getting uh, a, another Radio Joe station working and uh, that location up there at Mount Eliza <coughs> in that general area, Mount Martha is it? Mount Martha perhaps? 
um, I think would be probably an ideal spot, not as uh, not noisy. Anyway, that's another story for another day. Thanks, Dave, and uh, thanks for uh, the, the, the letting me know about the uh, the pressure blip uh, on uh, on Facebook. That was most interesting stuff indeed. All right, across to Ian BK three V I N at Kangaroo Flat BK three E K H. Happy New Year to you and everybody on the frequency. VIN BK3 EKH very good yeah you're averaging 15 to 20 <clears throat> peaking just over 20 and I confirm the same here uh, on your signal the, uh, the the conditions are a little bit variable uh, which is nothing unusual really so uh, uh, but you're fairly fairly well solid on uh, 20 over 9 and that's no preamp no nothing it's just straight as it is with the inverted V dipole um, so very good Thanks for the report, uh, Ian. And uh, yes, Tamitha gets really into her uh, solo reporting. Um, it's uh, it's it's a very visual thing. I think you need to uh, be able to tune into the YouTube feed uh, to be able to see her. She doesn't do any song and dance routines, of course, but uh, uh, she's quite uh, involved with the, the solo aspect, and she spends many hours on it. Actually, uh, a lot of her YouTube. Uh, um, uh, videos that she does goes for well over an hour um, so that's way too long to uh, be able to 
to show on television uh, on the ATV repeater. I think it's a bit, uh, a bit too long. But uh, her 10 minute uh, reports is ideal. That's, that's all I'm ever after from her. So uh, I have to uh, wait until she does that. Uh, nevertheless, uh, yeah, it is, uh, it is quite good. But um, <clears throat> yeah, as far as uh, Scott uh, Manley is concerned, his uh, YouTube channel is quite extensive. He's, uh, he actually gets quite a lot of viewers uh, on his uh, videos, so um, um, most interesting indeed. Anyway, and of course I'll continue with the uh, Brendan's uh, podcast uh, interviews. There's still plenty of interviews uh, that uh, Brendan's conducted from the astrophys.com uh, fame. So uh, I have lots to, uh, to, to still go through um, over the next uh, few months into this year. So it won't be just hearing me rambling on. <laughs> Thanks, Ian. Thanks very much, mate, for calling in. Much appreciated. Oh, and the Sunrise Times. Yeah, we've, we've, we've passed the solar equinox, equinox so um, uh, the, the days are getting progressively shorter. As an example, uh, for January, uh, the 1st of January sunrise was at 6.01. Uh, by the 11th of January, it was 6.10. By Friday the 21st today, it was 6.20 a.m. And by Monday the 31st of January, it will be rising at 6.31 a.m. Uh, the set times, uh, again at the beginning of the month, the set time was 8.45, 8.45, 8.41 and 8.34 uh, by the end of the month. So, um, though the day length is uh, progressively getting short. Um, so enjoy the extra bit of daylight that we've got to play with here. <laughs> Anyway, all right, I'll call it quits, but I'll, I'll just put out one more call if there's any other body else there. VK3, EKH, listening for any other stations. VK3, EKH, VK3, VAT. Welcome back. Thanks, Tony. How are you, mate? VK3, VAT, VK3, EKH. Yeah, I think I know what you mean. <laughs> uh, I'm finding that um, I'm only just beginning to sleep in a little bit longer in the morning uh, before getting up, but uh, it's it's an unusual sort of uh, feeling because uh, I'm not used to it. Uh, but I've got one more week before I go back to work. I've managed to to uh, to score another two weeks off. Um, and uh, yeah, so I go back on the 1st of February, maybe. <laughs> February is going to be a very telling month with the way things turn out for me, I think. So we'll just have to see about that. Uh, it's another story. Thanks, Tony. All right, this is VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel, the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria, concluding transmissions for the 21st of January 2022. We will, shall close the uh, YouTube uh, channel now. Um, there will be the next YouTube broadcast will be Sunday morning with the Wireless Institute of Australia broadcast, the visual representation uh, created by Bevan VK5 BD. So uh, I shall replay that on Sunday morning via the television repeater, uh, VK3 RTV. Digital Channel 2 and by YouTube if you want to watch it in high definition uh, the YouTube channel is there VK3 CSJ just look up VK3 CSJ on the YouTube channel <sighs> Struth all right cheers everyone take care thanks for joining me this uh, first Friday and um, we'll be back again next week to do it all again this is VK3 EKH concluding on 3541 <coughs> VK3 WV uh, yes, Dennis, go ahead. Yeah, I managed to watch right through the night uh, without falling off to sleep. And uh, I found Scott uh, most interesting. You, uh, you went without a hitch. Uh, the, the, the pickies were good right through. And uh, the 
understand now the comment I would make, and this is purely academic, there's a slight difference in your audio quality between 160 and 80. Yeah, funny about that. Uh, you're, uh, you're more bassy on, uh, on 80, and it uh, sounds a lot more natural. Anyway, I won't hold you up, and uh, nice to uh, nice to uh, see a good session tonight. VK3CSJ, and uh, good evening to everyone else. VK3WV. Yeah, thanks, Den. VK3WV, VK3CSJ. <laughs> um, yeah, I uh, I tend to uh, agree with that observation. I'm not 100% sure uh, what it is that's uh, the reason why that should be, um, because the um, uh, the audio uh, path is well. Look, there there is. Um, I mean, I'm going through the mixer. That's all EQ'd. For both channels, both radios, but then I do go through as two separate boxes for um, uh, for for both 160 and 80, and uh, even though all the controls are pretty much set the same, almost. Um, I when I put the headphones, this is one of the things I, I like about the um, the Pro 3 Icom 756 Pro 3s. You can monitor your uh, audio. Um, there's a little monitor function. You put the headphones on. And you can monitor the uh, uh, audio going into uh, to uh, both radios, and I can hear that. Uh, I can hear the difference between the two. And uh, as far as I know, the, even the radios themselves are set up correctly. Pretty sure that I don't, don't think there's any any built-in EQ that could be fiddled with these Pro Threes. The Pro Threes are a kind of uh, a, uh, you know like a, a one one design before they became made, uh, more um, software controlled type radios it was the multiple menus where you, you could uh, modify the EQ, um, EQ internal with the radio the Pro 3 I don't think does that uh, a, there's a couple of things you can fiddle with but um, I don't know I'll have, but I'll have to find out why that is because I would prefer to have um, the, the same audio of course on on both transmissions so uh, anyway and the other funny thing is too and I'm not sure what, what's uh, what's doing it but <laughs> the the 160 meter transmitter um, the uh, LCD display tends to flicker on modulation uh, it's almost as if and I'll check it later um, but it's almost as if the um, the inline fuses uh, on the DC lead might be a bit resistive and uh, as I modulate on uh, on 160, uh, maybe the, there's a bit of voltage drop uh, occurring. So, uh, but the display varies in intensity as uh, I modulate. Although with, with the 80 meter one, uh, both are identical radios, but the 80 meter one it doesn't do that at all. So I'll have to investigate why um, uh, that uh, display is uh, is doing that. But that's something else. Anyway, all right. Um, Okay, I shall uh, uh, close the YouTube stream down. I haven't done that yet. Um, and uh, uh, I'm thinking about heading up to Heathcote uh, tomorrow. Uh, there is a working bee up there. And uh, um, I know that we're, there's a, a bit of a, a session going on with the, uh, the Radio Jove antenna. So um, uh, that's a two and a half hour drive uh, up there. But I'll be back uh, later on. I won't be staying overnight or anything like that. I'll be uh, pretty much back um, uh, mid evening uh, before it gets uh, before it gets dark. Hopefully, I'll be able to get away that early. We'll see because tomorrow is a hot day and uh, this weekend is going to be pretty warm. And anything north of the uh, divide will probably be even hotter. So I uh, <laughs> don't think I'll be looking forward to working out in the sun. Anyways. All right, thanks, uh, Den, for the report, and um, uh, yeah, um, I think uh, I'll I'll go through what what else Scott has got, and if I see it's worth putting out over the uh, the airwaves, so I'll uh, I'll do it. But he's he's quite happy for me to do it. He's got no problems at all, providing I give him a little bit of credit there, which I've uh, already done. Uh, all right. Um, but up, up until uh, a few hours ago, the, this this area here was just a big mess, and uh, I've managed to tidy it up and uh, get things uh, sort of ready. So, uh, uh, and 
I haven't got the external speaker on this radio too, so everything's sounding tinny uh, through the internal speaker. I've uh, got to fix that up. VK3WV, VK3CSJ. Okay, Clint, very good. VK3CSJ, okay, very good. Yeah, Clint, you're things to be uh, to be twiddled. Um, there's, there's, no, there's no big deal about your 160 radio. It, 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 it is a bit different, but uh, you notice that because uh, I was switching backwards and forwards between uh, 80 and 160, going click, 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 and of course uh, that, that was noticeable, but there's nothing wrong with it. Uh, I mean, you could uh, uh, do nothing and uh, no one will complain. It was just, just an observation. Uh, obviously some, uh, some difference with the radio, somewhere I hope so. But, uh, given that, uh, that it is going to be a hot day, and given that you're going to a, a hotter than normal place over the over the ranges, um, it might uh, might uh, pay to have a, a, a spare a spare cask of water or something in there just in case. All right, catch you over the weekend, no doubt. Have a good one and uh, a good uh, good session tonight. Con- congratulations. VK three CSJ, VK three WV will be clear. Yep, thanks, Dean. Good on you, mate. Thanks very much. And uh, uh, we'll probably get uh, get you over here for a, a few minutes to help us with the uh, uh, vertical antenna because I definitely would like to uh, to retune that to 1825 before I go back to work. Maybe. We'll see. I've got one more week to, to be able to muck around, so we'll see how we go. Thanks, Dean. Cheers for now. We're out of here. VK3WV, VK3CSJ concluding transmission on 80 and uh, everywhere else. Uh, where, where am I not normally a lot stronger? I'm only running 100 watts. Uh, I'm not going through any linear uh, on 80. I was on 160. 160 had the linear on it, but that wasn't running much power. Uh, when I tuned it up, it was um, not much to uh, to talk about really. Um, but at least it was a bit more than 100 watts. And uh, but 80, yeah, I'm only running barefoot, as they say. So uh, I'll fix that up for the next week. The the only reason why I haven't I'm not running a linear on 160. Oh, sorry, on 80 meters is uh, is the PTT line. Uh, I've got to work out the um, uh, get the uh, connection for PTT to work. Uh, so um, yeah, I'll have to muck around with that. I'll try and do that uh, before next Friday. Hopefully, not a few hours before I go to air. Uh, dear. Anyways, just not enough hours in the day for all this sort of stuff. Thanks for sending the, the pressure uh, gradient uh, on your uh, station. Um, <laughs> I, I could see that the only way you could uh, to do that was with the mobile phone. Um, but it worked perfectly well. I could see the uh, gradient. And your vertical gradient, I, I worked out why your blip uh, was uh, much larger than what I was seeing. And that's only because the, the, um, the vertical axis uh, was, uh, was much greater, which amplified the, uh, the blip on the graph. Um, on my graph I had the, the chart this this wide uh, so that the blip wasn't as big but on your chart because it was more full screen so everything else was expanded out so uh, when I did the same thing on, on my weather station not a problem it uh, suddenly I saw this huge blip <laughs> um, but I still think it's really fascinating the way uh, we were all able to detect this uh, this pressure wave um, uh, that uh, was emitted from the, the uh, volcano explosion and uh, how far and wide that went um, and I, I was uh, saying to uh, I was saying to mum if, if we had been out in the country and away from noise like the traffic noise and, and practically away from any kind of noise there's a good possibility that we might have even heard 
uh, the sound of that explosion and that pressure wave. Um, some people claim that they heard it uh, on the, the in Brisbane. They they claim that they heard something. So um, would have been really interesting to have heard that as well. <sighs> Most interesting stuff. It really is. Um, yeah. Anyways, uh, but yeah. Thanks for that, Tony. And uh, that was very good. So yeah, if uh, you know, if anybody's listening uh, still, <laughs> um, check your weather stations. If you've got a, a weather station that stores uh, data, uh, have a look at your barometric pressure for last uh, Saturday, and uh, around seven o'clock in the evening, depending on where you are, and uh, you'll be uh, you'll, you'll should should have a little glip, gl glitch, blip, whatever on your, your pressure barometric pressure gradient. All right, um, I think that's about it. VK3 VAT, VK3 CSJ. Yeah, no worries, Tony. VK3 VAT, VK3 CSJ. Yeah. Um, so currently, uh, are you? Is your weather station is is it um, uh, is it upgraded? So it's actually reading uh, pro now. That so your tier is pro plus or pro something. Okay. Yeah, it's funny because I, I, I'm looking at your station right now, and it still tells me basic. Uh, it still tells me that your tier is is basic. Um, now I don't know why it hasn't gone to just pro. Um, when I click on on the little gear symbol next to basic, it says upgrade this station. Now I, I don't know why. I mean, this is your station, so I don't know why I would upgrade to, to uh, your station. I don't know why it works that way um, but uh, because you are pro I, I still don't know why uh, I'm not able to look at your chart information for instance uh, it says that uh, upgrade device to view charts and data 
Uh, it says the chart section allows you to visualize all your sensor data with custom line and bar charts on up to four different y-axis. Uh, with control over span and time you can view details and trends based on your configuration. Upgrade to Weatherlink Pro Plus to start using charts with this device today. That's that's what <laughs> that's what comes up when I look at um, uh, click on charts uh, on your station. So I don't don't know why I can't uh, I can't look at your data. I don't, I don't know whether it's something that you've got to do, like uh, to share um, to share your station with me. You would have to click on share, and then it says add share. So what you do there is I think uh, if I type in my call sign VK three CSJ, I think I think it will trigger on that. Let me just do that. See what happens. Yeah, there it is. So yeah, so if you type type in my call sign, you'll you'll bring up my station. Um, but because I'm doing it here on my system, it's the the, the uh, information I'm seeing here is a bit different. Um, it's actually telling me that I'm, I'm already sharing my data with you uh, but I think if if you did on your station if you um, on, on the internet side of it uh, sh click on share and uploads and it's the share and uploads um, is where you give a certain permission I'm not sure I'm not sure why it's so uh, so restrictive uh, the way they do this and that's, it's actually the problem that I found because I, I wanted to, to look at multiple weather stations to get to uh, to be able to look at the pressure charts uh, across uh, from from all, all over the place and um, everywhere I went it was uh, very hard to get information like uh, charts um, for some reason it just wasn't available or it wouldn't let me have a look at it so uh, go figure Go figure, as they say. But uh, nevertheless, uh, I know that when I uh, look at mine, my station, it's all there. Yeah. Mm. And, but at least you're now seeing the air quality uh, aspect. Oh, excuse me. So that's um, that's one thing. I'm about to to put that sensor outside too. So uh, at the moment, the sensor's just over here, uh, near near the window. Um, so it's uh, the window is open at this stage. Yep. So it's getting uh, it's getting out out uh, outside air onto it. But I want to put the sensor out near uh, mounted off the side of the tower. So I have to actually carry five volt rail, um, a five volt supply. Down to uh, to where the sensor is going to, going to be, but because the sensor communicates to the Wi-Fi modem, um, <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised if I take the sensor out there to the the, the tower mounted off the side of the tower, that I lose the Wi-Fi signal. I, I'm not sure the range of uh, the Wi-Fi connection, but uh, hopefully it'll work. Hopefully, uh, just putting it uh, um, what is it uh, about 15 meters uh, away from the barn. Uh, it won't make any difference to uh, to the Wi-Fi signal, um, so anyway, we'll, we'll find out. All right, Tony, I'll uh, leave you with that, and um, uh, I'm <laughs> I'm not sure if I'm really looking forward to this uh, journey to uh, to Heathcote tomorrow. Two and a half hour drive, and I, I'm sure I'll be constantly looking at the temperature gauge. <laughs> If I see any slightest deviation in the temperature, I'll uh, I'll have to think twice about continuing on. But uh, we should be all right. So far, the, some of the long drives that I've had uh, have proved okay. Uh, the Subaru. Anyway, all right, Tone. I'll leave you with that. VK three W. No, that's Dennis. VK three V A T. VK three CSJ. CSJ.
no, there's no, there's no actual save. Um, although there is a saved. I think that's a different thing altogether. Uh, but when you, where, where it, um, when you know that you've saved a station, a weather station, like I, I've, I've got you, you both you and Graham. Uh, on the system here, um, so it's under. It comes under manage shares. So um, uh, if I click on manage shares, there's you and Graham. So I know that you've been saved. I know that that information has been saved. And if I wanted to add another station, it's it's there's a um, the add share. So um, uh, that's where I would let's see if I go add share. So it's a separate little window that opens. And I'd put in the ID of that other station just in there, and do a search, and it should come up. And then you'd uh, you'd click on that to 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 save it. Yeah, it's a bit of a funny arrangement, isn't it? Um, but uh, it uh, just requires a little bit of playing around. <laughs> well, it's basically what I ended up doing: having to, having to play around until I finally got it sussed. Um, and. Uh, you know, I, I wouldn't have worked out the, the fact that the air quality sensor um, needed to be outdoors, set, set as an outdoor unit for it to work. Because I initially had it set as an indoor unit, it wasn't going to work. I, I could see the data, but no one else was going to see it. That's just a security feature. So um, uh, now that I've selected outdoors, everybody can now see the air quality for uh, Narry Warren South. <laughs> Um, which is very good at the moment. Uh, so uh, yeah. Anyway, we're getting there. We're getting there with all this stuff. Um, but uh, it's it's quite interesting to uh, to look at. And all my data suddenly disappeared for the particulate. I don't know why. For the little bar graph. There's a little bar graph for. Particul particulate matter, uh, particulate matter one, parti particulate matter two, point five, and particulate matter um, ten. And that's disappeared all of a sudden. Maybe I need to refresh the page. Just refresh this and see what happens. No, oh, that's gone too. I don't know where that is. Oh well, I don't think my station's fallen over. Maybe it has. <laughs> That's it. I'm retiring. Um, I'll uh, uh, if if I head up to to Heathcote, it'll, it'll be I'll be. I hope to be on the road around about nine thirty, uh, nine thirty to ten o'clock. It's a two and a half hour drive, so uh, if all goes to plan, uh, I should be arriving up at. Uh, at the radio site um, around about um, probably about 11.30 to 12 o'clock which would be uh, at least to get about six hours of, uh, of work done one way or another and then I'll be heading home again cross fingers uh, but I, I still may decide at the last moment not to not to make the trip just depends on how I feel VK3VAT uh, VK3CSJ Use my call sign. 
to use my call sign. <laughs> All this feedback. Um, yeah. Uh, see, if I if I like. To, to find you, I, I actually had to put your name in uh, the way it's the way you've entered it for it to work, and it was the same for Graham. I had to put in Graham's name for it to work. It wasn't it wasn't anything else. So um, so the my my as you know the the station uh, ID is Narry Warren South WX, but if you took put in Narry Warren South WX, that's oh stop belching. Uh, that doesn't work. So <clears throat> uh, I, I'd forgotten that I used uh, VK3CSJ. Um, so well, of course, I, I think I found that by uh, by trial and error. Um, so, but yeah, VK3CSJ, you'll find the necessary data. And uh, when you like you, it's under Add Share. So um, you put my call sign in. search and there it is it comes up it finds me self upgraded it even says self upgraded <laughs> but when you do it you should be able to find yes my my name call sign and email address and there should should be uh, uh, something there that it's I don't think it comes up saved but it's the fact that you found it. Um, I can't remember if there's anything else to click on. Um, maybe I should go f finding another station here. Let's see. Uh, manage shares. Um, what's the summary telling me? Don't know what the summary is telling me. It's uh, completely something else. All right. Um, so I'll just close that down. And if I look up the map and uh, see if I can find another local station, um, yeah, who can I pick on? I think there's a station down in Tarragon. That's interesting. I can't see Graham on this map. Uh, I don't know why Graham's not on the map. Why isn't Graham on the map? Um, but there's a station at Tarolgan and the Avenue. Mm, I'm not sure if that's what he calls himself or not, I don't know. Um, let's have a look here. Who's this chap? Oh, it's me. Okay. Uh, there's a chap up at Warburton. LP View. It's uh, something else, I think. I can have a look at this LP view for Wilton. Okay, so station, current station, it's an LP view they call it, VUE. Uh, let's see, if I go back to my station, go away. Himself and she. Uh, I don't know if this is working or not, actually. LP view. What's it do? I'm going to search on that. Nothing. Nothing found at all. Yeah, so station, station names you can't. You can't search on. You need some other information. Um, I'm looking at this particular chap, this weather station up at uh, Warburton area, and uh, I don't know. I don't know what he calls himself. Yeah, I don't know how you go about doing this, actually. Anyway, 
chart, what happens if I click on chart? No, nothing. Alright. Yeah, I don't know. It should be a bit easier than this. You should be able to look at any of these weather stations. There's one in Ballarat. It's called Robin Gordon. And there's nothing else there that tells me anything else about his station that I could allow to sell date, save data to um, shared saved um, yeah hang on a sec just do that a bit Turned up the volume. It's a pro. <laughs> I can see pro now. Chart. All right. My goodness me! Look at your barometer reading. Um, let's see if I can share this screen so you can see what I'm seeing. Um, let me see. Let me see. Let me see. Um, uh, what I've got to do, add uh, it's desktop, that, that one there, local display capture, Firefox, I think that might be it, Firefox, and uh, no, that's not going to work for me, uh, close that, add desktop capture one of these is uh, one of these oh, I don't know which one it is no that's not it always a, a, a fiddle to try and find Play. <gasps> My goodness me, have a look at this. Um, display to no, Firefox, no, Vmix, no, Vmix 2. I've got I've got you here on the full screen. Your chart is occupying this full screen here beautifully. I should be able to What have we got to do? Phoenix add input desktop capture. It should be this I should but click on Firefox and should do it. What's it doing? It's a white screen. I've got a white screen here. Um, display. Firefox. No, it's not, not working for me. This is such a trick sometimes with all this business. Um, desktop capture. There is a trick. I, I yes, yes, yes. I'm remembering something now. I have to Windows Graphic Capture. I think that's what I've got to select. And that no, it comes up saying fault. Um, GDI. What's the GDI do? 
Struth. No, that's not it. Multiple clicks back and forth here. Uh, local desktop capture, uh, Firefox. Uh, try this again. There we go, we've got it. We have it. This is what we are currently seeing at this location. Oops, I'm back again, sorry. So it's a wavy line. <laughs> um, I don't know whether I can click on this or not. Show curse, I can. Yeah. I can't. Um, yeah, I can't quite. Uh, oh, hang on. No, it's not doing anything. Just seeing if I can change the chart. Maybe if I go back and can I change it on the other window here? Show cursor. Um, yeah, I know there's a. Oh, it's a capture. That's why it's not working. It's just a screen capture. Uh, that's why it's not working. Um, okay, fair enough. Uh, so yeah, um, we are seeing now. Yes, your barometer reading, and for that matter, I should be able to see anything else too. I guess. Um, I just you know, brought up my other station local station I'll wait for that to upload before I can do anything there it goes okay um, back to here so yes so I can see I can go to bulletin and I can see all your stuff there and chart and uh, I should be able to add a chart so at the moment all that's being displayed here is the one chart but I can bring up I can actually add charts so I can I've just brought up a second chart and I can put um, perhaps temperature uh, inside temp high low where is it that's my temperature temperature uh, and humidity humidity update uh, okay so if I go back a day there it is so this is what I'm now seeing because I can I can do this uh, back to here oh there it is there it is so that's now I've now added uh, another chart um, to to your station, although not directly to your station, <laughs> uh, but at least I can now manipulate your weather data, and I can actually now see um, temperature and humidity um, on the, on your station. So that's worked perfectly well, uh, not a problem at all. Pit that's uh, not HD. Um, because it was a, a HD a transmission, you'd be able to see all that finer detail in that uh, for sure. Anyway, all right, that's working now, Tony. So uh, that's a another box uh, ticked. <laughs> VK three W uh, VK three VAT VK three CSJ on ninety meters as well.
Oh yeah, no, 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 sorry, I had the audio off on TV. Um, yeah, so there's a there's a little box that I've ticked called uh, Absolute Pressure. So uh, I'm not really sure what that's uh, showing us, but um, that's that third chart. Um, <laughs> and you would click on that, Absolute uh, absolute Pressure. I don't have that uh, on my uh, boxes um, at the side of the, uh, the side of the uh, screen it doesn't uh, it doesn't have uh, absolute pressure so uh, that's a very interesting one don't uh, don't know exactly what that's revealing um, anyway but I don't think I can go any further than three charts I think you're a bit limited uh, let me see um, go back to your live let's see if we can add another chart yeah see you, it says here you are only allowed to add a maximum of three charts on this page, so uh, that's it. But you can you can add the data. You know you can have one chart for barometric pressure, but you can add another uh, information line. Um, so on my charts, you can look at uh, the UV radiation <coughs> with uh, solar radiation. So I I. I uh, I'm not sure if I've still got it, but you can actually um, do that. You can look at the UV sensor and uh, the solar radiation sensor t together on the one chart, so you can you can see how things sort of uh, correlate in that way. But uh, that's fantastic. So uh, yeah, if we can get uh, Graham to uh, to jump to Pro, um, although again, I think all all Graham needs to do is to share share my station with his. So. If, you, if you're listening in the background, Graham, if you uh, just type in VK3CSJ in Manage Shares uh, or Add Share, yeah, so add under under Share and Uploads, and you go to Add Share and you type in VK3CSJ, um, you should be able to find my station, and, and from there, uh, I should be able to see uh, uh, these interesting charts, which is. Um, uh, am I still YouTubing here? Maybe I'm still. Oh yeah, no, I'm still streaming. So, so very pleasant. Good evening to. Uh, or good morning to anybody watching the YouTube stream. I forgot about that. I'm still streaming. So if you uh, want to subscribe, subscribe, and if you want to donate money, donate to my Patreon. And there's a little bell there. Click on that bell, and you get any, you know information when I'm streaming again. Who cares? <laughs> Uh, All right, Tony, I'm out of here. I must go. Um, I've been sitting in this chair for too long. VK3VAT in uh, just two kilometres away from me, VK3CSJ. Thanks, Tony. No worries, mate. We'll um, 
we'll give a call on the on the repeater on the way out. Um, and you know, I've actually discovered that my antenna on the car was loose. Uh, I I forget the the number, the model number, but it's a a quad uh, antenna to suit the quad uh, um, the Waxon, and uh, it, co it covers 29. 29 megahertz up to 70 centimeters and uh, the first join in the antenna in fact I've, I've lost the two Allen the two grub screws the body there was two two grub screws that were holding the antenna on the lower section and uh, I was um, I pulled the antenna up to bring it down because I was going under a tree and uh, all of a sudden the top part came off and I thought oh well, yeah that's loose and then I had a look and the the two grub screws are missing so I'm gonna have to take out one grub screw because just above that there's another two two grub screws holding the top section together so I'm just gonna have to take out one grub screw holding in the top section and bring it down to the bottom and uh, screw that in uh, otherwise I won't be able to, to use the antenna in my mobile tomorrow so that might explain why I might have been having a, a few weak signals into the repeater while driving around because uh, uh, I'd lost the two grub screws bloody hell that's vibrations for you the physics of vibration anyway cheers I'm going VK3VAT VK3CSJ Cheers, Tony. Take care. BK3 sees Joe And to everybody who's still watching, a very pleasant good mornings.